before you master the art of shoulder abductions, here are a few things that you need to know. The glenohumeral joint of the shoulder is designed to offer an incredibly diverse range of motion. It's a shallow ball and socket joint that looks like a golf ball on a tee. But think of how easy it is to knock a ball off its tee. In the same way, the bony architecture is inherently unstable and prone to dislocation. It tries to overcome this by using soft tissue, i.e. ligaments and surrounding muscles as stabilizers. The glenoid is deepened by the labrum, the circular ligament shown here in dark blue. The glenohumeral joint is also surrounded by the light blue capsular ligaments. The joint receives additional support from rotator cuff muscles that ensure that the ball remains in the socket during movement. Let's not forget that numerous nerves and vessels responsible for the innervation and perfusion of the arm run through the axilla the most vulnerable being the axillary nerve and artery. Shoulder dislocations are diagnosed based on history, physical examination, and radiological findings. History often reveals recent trauma to the shoulder. The patient may report having felt the shoulder pop or roll out during the incident. Other causes are atraumatic, such as ligament laxity. History is therefore crucial to reveal the mechanism of injury as well as the position of the arm at the time of injury. About 95% of shoulders dislocate anteriorly. This results from a forceful abduction and external rotation of the arm caused by a fall or a direct blow on an outstretched hand. The humerus is displaced anteriorly and usually comes to rest below the coracoid process. In your emergency room, a patient with a shoulder dislocation will present with severe shoulder pain and holding the dislocated arm in the unaffected arm. On examination, the shoulder appears flattened with squaring off of the shoulder contour. The humeral head may be palpable below the coracoid process. The patient will elicit painful limitation in all ranges of shoulder movements. Always remember to check pulses and pay particular attention to the axillary nerve function by testing for sensation over the deltoid muscle. Posterior dislocations are less common and often missed. They result from forceful adduction and internal rotation of the shoulder caused by muscle con contraction, usually from electric shock or seizure. X-rays should be taken before and after reduction to exclude fractures of the humerus or the glenoid. You will need three x-ray views to confirm shoulder dislocation, an AP view, a lateral scapular view, as well as a modified axillary view. When interpreting the x-ray, comment on the direction of dislocation and look for other associated features such as the heel sac lesion, bony bunker lesions, humeral as well as clavicular fracture. In anterior dislocations, the humeral head is displaced medially and overlies the glenoid cavity, as shown. Posterior dislocations are diagnosed by the presence of light bulb sign, as seen on the AP view. In this section, we'll be discussing the management of anterior and posterior shoulder dislocations. Adequate pain control and muscle relaxation in conjunction with smooth atraumatic techniques are the keys to a successful reduction. Slow, consistent movements by the operator prevent pain and associated muscle spasm. Quick pulling or release of tension is sure to cause resistance and pain. Please do not forget to do a neurovascular assessment before and after the shoulder reduction technique. The most commonly used maneuver in our setting is called the Hippocratic maneuver. Step one, first abduct the arm by 45 degrees. Then use a sheet or your foot as a fulcrum, preferably a sheet. The sheet should be wrapped tightly around the patient's axilla and an assistant should lead back while tightly holding the sheet, no pulling. Thirdly, hold the arm whilst leaning backwards, also no pulling. This should be done for 10 to 15 minutes to reduce injury to the brachial plexus. Cochus maneuver. Take the affected arm and fully adduct the humerus. Tell the patient to pull their chest out, shoulders back, and to also relax, and then flex the elbow to 90 degrees. Firstly, supinate the wrist and externally rotate the shoulder until resistance is felt. No longitudinal traction should be applied. 
perform the movement slowly to allow time for spasm and pain to resolve. Move the humerus forward in the sagittal plane. And lastly, internally rotate the arm. The modified mulch technique. It is important to tell your patient you will move very gently and slowly and to notify you if they feel any pain. Step 1. Use your left hand to stabilize the trapezius muscle and fix the scapula with your thumb. Step 2. Use your right hand to grab the wrist and hold the humerus. Step 3. Slowly abduct the humerus to 100 degrees. With the scapula fixed, this will be your zero position. Step 4. Externally rotate the humerus and apply gentle longitudinal traction. If the shoulder has not relocated by now, continue on to step 5. Step 5. Call an assistant to push the bony prominence of the humerus head anteriorly, moving it past the glenoid rim and causing relocation. Signs of a successful anterior reduction technique include the following. Palpable or audible clank return of rounded shoulder contour, relief of pain, and increase in range of motion. After successful reduction of an anterior shoulder dislocation, immobilize the affected arm with collar and cuff within the first 24 hours. Refer patient to an orthopedic surgeon within one week. Gentle pendular motion exercises should be performed during the immobilization period to reduce the risk of frozen shoulder. Posterior shoulder reduction techniques. Step one, apply traction to the arm above the elbow. Step two, adduct the shoulder and internally rotate the arm. Step three, get an assistant to apply counter traction with the opposite side using a sheet. Step four, Get another assistant to apply anteriorly directed pressure on the posterior aspect of the humeral head. The shoulder should move back into its rightful position. If the method is successful, the arm is immobilized in a neutral position. Following an acute traumatic dislocation, the anterior inferior labrum may detach from the glenoid and break off a piece of bone along with it, creating a bony bankart lesion. An association the posterior lateral parts of the humeral head may be depressed after being whacked against the joint socket. This is called a Hilsax lesion. These lesions render shoulder more susceptible to dislocation. In young adults, usually athletes, the labrum and inferior parts of the capsule are typically torn. They are prone to recurrent dislocations because a. recurrent dislocations are dependent on the age of first dislocation and b. Less force is needed to overcome the weak capsule. The elderly are more prone to rotator cuff tears and axillary artery damage. This could be due to age-related tender degeneration and fragile vessels. The axillary nerve is commonly injured in either the dislocation or reduction process. The patient may be unable to contract the deltoid and experiences a patch of anesthesia over the deltoid area. An important late complication is shoulder stiffness, thus active exercises should be imperative in the long-term management.